like clockwork. Hey, man, I haven't seen you in weeks, but it was only a week, I guess. I know, but it's nice to have a specific thing to look forward to on a specific day in this completely distorted reality where weekends and weeks blur together. So every Friday is a little like a holiday, a little like something to look forward to, a little like something nice under the tree. <laughs> Always good. It's always good. It's nighttime for you. It's still afternoon for me, but uh, always good to see you. And indeed, we have such a great thing for you tonight. The closing of Winterland, one of the epic shows of all time. Massive historical importance. Uh, and we'll be getting to our very special guest in just a moment. We want to tell you first, though, that uh, as we have from the beginning of this thing, this is our fourth. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, we are raising money for a wonderful cause. We're going to be doing that each Friday for as long as this goes on. This is going to go on as long as it has to, <laughs> as long as you folks are confined to home and are jonesing for Grateful Dead and community and all that. We're going to be here doing this, and uh, we have a great beneficiary, as we have all the previous weeks. It's the PBS Foundation. And the Dead's history with PBS is very long. Um, you know, well, this this concert we're about to see appeared on PBS, right? That's right. A local PBS station in San Francisco, KQED, carried this massive, insane evening live, uh, which meant uh, they were in the house till about six or seven in the morning, I think. Uh, and PBS is such an incredible resource in all of our lives, not just Deadheads. I think if there are parents out there, and we know there are many deadheads with kids, uh, I would bet PBS is pay playing a big role in your life right now because since the kids are out of school, PBS is a precious educational resource as well as a cultural one in the evening for us folks. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it is integral to your kids' education as it has been to the education and preschool education of so many kids through Sesame Street and all the wonderful children's programming they've had over the years. Uh, and of course, it's not a specifically COVID-19 oriented charity, but it is because at this moment in our lives, we need a lot of great cultural input and PBS has been providing that for years, as well as news and information and public affairs programming. So we would love for you to hit that donate button that's on your screen, uh, probably to the right hand side of your screen if you're watching this on desktop or um, I don't know if you're doing this on a handheld device or an, uh, a pad or something. It could be in a different place, but it's a big blue button. It is. So and if you're not colorblind. And we have uh, we have a bit of news about our, uh, our donations. Um, yeah. We've raised a lot of money the last three weeks. This is our fourth, as Gary says. And if we hit a certain target by tonight, a cumulative uh, 50, $50,000, $50, I think. Yeah. Um, we are going to, uh, as you probably noticed, the previous three Shakedown streams we've uh, taken off the uh, off the YouTube, um, we're going to put them back up. So that's uh, the Grateful Dead movie and the Buckeye show from last week and, of course, the Great Buffalo show from 89. So we're going to put those back on YouTube as a, a thank you for um, supporting all these great charities. I think we're just a few thousand dollars away from hitting that 50. So um, we'll hit it tonight, I'm, I'm hopeful, and get the money to PBS. All you moms and dads out there that are homeschooling, it's not easy. So uh, I know you're probably help uh, using some of those PBS resources. So try to kick in. We understand it's a tough time. But um, as Gary said last week, a dollar, five dollars, whatever it is, everything counts and everything really helps and is really appreciated. So let's get up to 50,000 over the last four weeks and then we'll throw up some more videos and keep them up on YouTube so you can enjoy them anytime, not just on Friday nights. Wow, it's just like a, a PBS fund drive. If they hit a certain number, they get a thank you gift. I yeah, love it. You get it. You will send you your tote bag and maybe. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's not overpromise here. But yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, as I said, I don't know the exact number of eyes we have on us right now, but if everyone out there kicks down two dollars, we will probably match the goals that we've had the previous four weeks, or the, or the totals we've hit the previous four weeks. Plus, we'll go over that fifty k amount. And you'll get to watch all those previous Shakedown stream shows that because this is supposed to be live and, and in the moment, you know, we it stays up there for a little while, then we take it down, but we will free them all up. So you will have a variety of things to watch if you didn't catch one of the previous webcasts. So that's the pitch 
for donations. We know you will be generous because deadheads always have been. Uh, but we need to talk about Winterland. We need to talk about the closing of Winterland. And uh, David, I hate to break this to you, but of the three people who are going to be on the screen tonight, I think you were the only one who wasn't there. I wasn't there. Oh, my gosh. You're right. I was. Uh, I couldn't get out. I was eight years old. That's a terrible injustice. Uh, mm -hmm. So two out of the three of us uh, were there, but only one of us was on stage. So I think he's the really important one. So we're going to bring her in right now, aren't we? David, why don't you do the honors? We are very honored. Uh, I'm thrilled. You know, Gary and I are huge deadheads. And uh, to have this very special guest, Donna Jean Godchow. Thank you for coming on, Donna. And let's bring her on. Uh, this is a thrill for us. Hey, Donna. Oh, looking so lovely. <laughs> you always are. Hey, you guys. Hi, Donna Jean. Hey, boys. So how, you have how are you? How are you doing in Alabama? We're we're doing okay. We're trying to obey whatever is whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just like so nebulous, what to do? But we know what to do, and that's to stay out of the way, stay safe, and do everything that we know, all the measures to keep this thing under control. Absolutely. So I applaud you guys and what you're doing. Uh, well, you know, for everybody. <laughs> we're having so much fun doing it. It don't feel like work, I'll tell you. Well, it, it's, um, it's a privilege to be able to have this kind of, uh, thing to bring to people that produces knowledge to people who may may or may not be watching this kind of show. Yeah. So if you're watching this kind of show, this is where it's at. Do what <laughs> it is. Contribute to those charities and let's get on with this program of getting well and getting healthy in America. Okay, that's my two cents. Thank Beautifully you. put. Worth a lot more than two cents, I'd say. Yeah, indeed. So, Donna, we know that Winterland looms very large in your life. Uh, in addition to having played this fantastic show and having played a bunch of shows as a member of the Grateful Dead before that, didn't you see your first Grateful Dead show at Winterland? Am I right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I saw my first uh, show at Winterland and I was determined because everybody else loved the Grateful Dead and I had just come from Muscle Shoals and I said, you guys are just stoned. You know, you, you, you just, you, you don't know music. You don't know what you're talking about. And so I refused when they finally made me come and see a Grateful Dead concert. It was in the back row of the balcony of Winterland. <laughs> And I was unstoned. And uh, that band came on and I said, I just threw up my hands. And I said, when I sing again, it's going to be with that band. Wow. You know, I, I don't know how they do that. I don't know how they do it. But whatever it is, it's something that I've never seen or heard of before in my musical history or thought process. And I saw the Grateful Dead and I said, this is it for me. This is who I am. And I'm going to go for it. And you're the only person who ever got to say that and make it happen. <laughs> you know, I mean, other musicians came and went from the Grateful Dead, but they were more or less recruited. You, on the other hand, had this vision and you saw it through. Oh, I definitely had a vision. And the vision that I had really stemmed from the fact that I heard Keith play and I knew that he had the goods. I knew he had the goods. Keith and I, neither one had any idea that Pigpen was in the shape that he was in. So we weren't there to audition like for anything. It's just that this is who we are. Help, you know, something. And, uh, and it, the rest is history. You know, it all turned out. And, and no, no one introduced you to the band. You, you went up to Gary and we started talking. Yes, I did. <laughs> was it Keystone Berkeley? I think it was Keystone, San Francisco. Okay. 
and he walked beside us, you know, and Keith and I are just green as can be. I mean, we might as well have been just wearing green, you know, and uh, he walked beside us uh, from the, the one of the first Garcia bands. And, uh, and I just tugged him at his shoulder and I said, my husband and I have something we need to talk to you about. And I said, I need your home telephone number <laughs> so that we can call you and set something up. I mean, that's how that's how confident I was in my husband, you know. And what I had done was a whole nother story. But I knew that within the Grateful Dead structure of musicianship, he was the guy. I knew that. And uh, it was not like magical thinking. Oh, well, I can play with the Grateful Dead. Um, and I've he heard people come up and say things like that. No, you have to have the goods first. You have the goods and then you have a chance. Mm -hmm. And then the chance turns into the opportunity and the when and how this happens. And it, it's all different than something that you just think in your head. It's something that is, uh, I might say, almost already done. It's so there. And I knew that, and that's what gave me the confidence in uh, pursuing the whole thing with the Grateful Dead and Keith, and then eventually me. And any number of people probably hit on Jerry Garcia at some point, and you would have loved to have his home phone number. And I would imagine he didn't give it to just anyone. So you must have been projecting so much assurance, you know, and so much confidence. Well, that I was projecting, but he was receiving. Yes. I mean, Jerry was very smart in that way. You know, he could read people and he could read things, you know, and and when I looked at him and said, I need your home telephone number, he knew that I meant business. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he just knew it. And uh, he gave it to me. And I didn't call him. I said, I, I will call the office uh, and see if I can get in touch with you. I'm not going to try to call your home phone. Number. And I called the office like 20 times. This is Donna God show. Uh, Jerry asked me to call. Nobody ever told him that I called. And so finally, I called him on his home telephone number and I said, okay, when are the Grateful Dead rehearsing again? <laughs> I mean, I was that bold because I knew where my husband stood with that band. And um, whatever part I could play, I would love it. And have since over all of these 40 something years loved the fact that I got to do that. But, but Keith was the one who he so had the goods. I just mm -hmm. laid it out to Jerry and, um, and he heard him and we were uh, rehearsed with he and Billy that first night. And it was just like, it was magic. Mm -hmm. It just, Anyway, and it was it was so right for their music at that moment, you know, the way their music was going, um, you know, and as you said, you didn't know anything about Pigpen's we condition that. Where, that they were that Pigpen was going to take a, need, a leave of absence for a few months from the band, and that they were going to need a keyboard player. We knew nothing. Mm -hmm. We knew nothing. We were driving around in a broken Corvair. You know, we didn't know anything about anybody or anything. And all we had was a knowledge that this is what's right. And this is, you know, you, there's nothing else we can do but this. And that's what we did. It was a perfect fit from the very beginning. Keith's first show was in Minnesota, 1971. And it was a perfect fit from that very first, the first notes of his first show. You can hear that this was and it just as Gary says, it was the perfect fit for that band at that time. Yeah, my my first show with Keith was in Albuquerque, so that would have been November of seventy one, uh, and I loved what I was hearing. I you know, we'd never had a piano in the band, 
rather than a Hammond organ or a Vox organ before that. And, and Keith just knew where to find the little spots to jump in. And more important, he knew what to leave out. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and that was such an unusual quality in a lot of rock and roll musicians. You know, he understood the jazz aspect. He could do those little Floyd Kramer trills with the right hand on the country songs. He just fit the bill so perfectly. And then my next show was, I believe, Pigpen's first show back. So it was Pig and Keith for a little while. Um, and that worked fine, too. They played beautifully together. Pigpen's contributions were a little more minimal, but they really fit beautifully together on the Europe 72 tour, for example. We loved him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We loved him. Everyone who knew him did. You know, he people from, from the outside, people thought, oh, he's he's the badass in the band, but what a sweetheart. The, the gruff biker. And, you know, I've heard the story from Eileen or Sue and you, Donna, and just that Pigpen was the sweetest man anyone's met. And uh, again, as Gary says, he had this gruff biker appearance, but no, everybody says he was super sweet. Yeah. He was filled with cotton candy. <laughs> Love that. So this is an incredibly short time to talk about this stuff. So we, oh, I know. your whole history with the Grateful Dead, was, it went on uh, from that Keith joined in 71, you in early 72, and it went on until early 1979. But we have to jump forward to Winterland, uh, a place you played with the Grateful Dead many times. It's huge in my life because it was the, my very first night in San Francisco or on the West Coast at all was New Year's Eve 1970 into 71. I was at the, the farewell shows before they took the hiatus in 74 and then had to be there for the closing of Winterland, you know, which, at which I saw so many incredible shows, not just by the Grateful Dead, but... So well, many you people. Have you have to be there. You had to be there. Uh, and I got a last minute miracle kind of. I didn't have a ticket until the day of the show, but I was destined. So so this was one of the wildest nights. You know, Bill Graham pulled out all the stops. I think the doors open around five o'clock. Um, they showed the Animal House movie since John Belushi with, was on the bill with the Blues Brothers. Uh then I believe the New Riders played and then the Blues Brothers. Was that the order? Yes. It was the first, I think the first real live gig by the Blues Brothers. You know, John Belushi and Dad Aykroyd had done this thing as a little bit on Saturday Night Live. Oh, gosh. Uh, but they brought in one of the greatest bands you could ever assemble. They Steve were Cropper, Duck Dunn. Hilarious. Yes. Yeah. They were hilarious. Yeah. I love them so much and their dance steps and everything that they did with their music. Right. Well, it was just brilliant. And then uh, at the closing of Winterland, uh, Bill Murray was standing next to me when the Blues Brothers were playing. And he was just bummed. I mean, just bummed that they wouldn't let him sing with them. <laughs> but we were all, you have to understand, we were all in another world. Yes. That's the way I'm going to say it. That's, and he was just bummed and he talked to me about it. I want to be up there so bad. And I said, honey, don't worry about a thing. You got, <laughs> you're going to be okay. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, it's, it was an amazing night. Uh, yeah. Bill Graham as ever the New Year's Eve tradition served breakfast for 5,500 people at I think about 7 a.m. And what transpired in between is what we're about to see. <laughs> uh, compressed a little bit without the set breaks and all that, but. Well, I, I loved Bill Graham. Let me just say this right off the bat. I loved him. When I was eight and a half months pregnant and I believe we were playing in Phoenix and mm -hmm. all of a sudden I knew I couldn't play another gig. Mm -hmm. Bill Graham took me on his private jet and flew me back to California, back to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was always to me an ultimate gentleman. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he did what he had to do to be who he was, you know, in the larger scene. But to me, he, he was just very special and personal. And I will never forget that about him. Indeed. 
Uh, should we answer some questions? We I think so. You know, Donna, you touched on something when you were just talking about Bill Murray. And this kind of feeds into one of the questions. We got a lot of questions for you, Donna. But we'll, we've, we've picked a few. And one of them was memories that you have of either specific shows or tours or eras. And, and when you brought up that Bill Murray story, it made me think, when you, are your memories of dead shows, is it this, is, do you remember being on stage and, and a particularly great night? Or is it those stories? Is it the things that happened maybe before the show at Soundcheck or, or something? Do you have certain shows that really stand out for any reason, whether it's a Bill Murray episode or it's the show itself? Well, um, that's very hard to answer because we were on the road so much and played so many shows and people expect that you're going to remember every song that you played for every show. And it's just, I mean, for me, I'm not speaking for the others, but for me, it was just impossible mm -hmm. like to regurgitate, you know, what that was uh, in any kind of intelligent way. Like I really know what I'm talking about. I'd, ima I'd imagine it would be easier to differentiate between certain like major things like the Europe tour or going to Egypt, like that would stand out in a certain way rather than one okay. tour date or another. I was about to get to that and you know me well and you know. I do indeed. <laughs> uh, Europe 72 was mine at first, mine and Keith's first tour. And obviously we had only done, I had, only done New York with the Hills Angels and then going straight to Europe, you know, from being from Sheffield, Alabama, you know, in the Muscle Shoals area, and then right into the fray of what that means, you know, to be a rock and roller and go, you know, global. And so, uh, I was scared to death and I think Keith was kind of scared to death too, but we got through it and loved it. And I would give anything to revisit all of those places that I was so scared of, like Paris, like to get out of the, the room or, you know, in, anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. just to um, acquaint myself you know, with the rest of the planet, you know, and it was tough, you know, that was tough, but it was wonderful. And what came out of it musically was just ask anybody. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you that it was awesome. Right. And on every level, it yeah. was awesome. You know, going down the Rhine, uh, the Rhine River, wow. and oh, there's a castle on the left. <laughs> Kind of thing, you know, from all of the buses, uh, the two buses, and uh, you know, that was one thing that was very special. At 74, uh, I had had Zion, he was a baby, I had to take my sister with me, and and he was sick, and they didn't know what pampers were, and blah blah <laughs> blah, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, so that kind of integrates in my memory. Mm -hmm. what that was like. And then uh, Egypt is something I shall never forget as long as I live. Mm. How incredible that was on so many levels that uh, I can't, I can hardly talk about, you know, the, the levels that that was on for all of us. You know, and Phil was an Egyptologist, mm -hmm. and he kind of got this ball rolling. And then the rest of us, you know, were really falling in line. You know, it was it it was it it was a thing. It was a real thing. And of course, uh, there were planes that took off from America with loads of deadheads. You know, and people in front of them going, oh, well, they ruined my whole trip. <laughs> you know, because of the deadheads that were on the plane. But <laughs> Egypt was awesome. It was wonderful at that time. Mm -hmm. wonderful. And, and they loved us. They mm -hmm. got it. 
And it, it just shows you and tells you in no uncertain terms that music translates anything, mm -hmm. anything you can throw in front of it. You throw some good music in there and there's somebody on this planet who is listening and loves it. Mm -hmm. And the Grateful Dead have demonstrated time and time again and decade after decade again that they are one of those bands that have contributed to uh, the good breeding of this world. Mm. And, and Beautifully put. And yep. how to respond to things that are just unusual. Yes. And uh, I wouldn't take anything in this world for not only being there, but being in the band, mm -hmm. the Grateful Dead, there's nothing like the Grateful Dead concert. Yes. Indeed. Uh, Don, I've got a question uh, from an online correspondent of mine, Corey. Uh, he had a lot of very complex questions, but I'm boiling it down. And since he mentioned Alabama, I wore this T-shirt our first week, um, but it had to make a return appearance. I've got my, got my Fame Studios T-shirt here oh, just okay. for you. Muscle Shoals. Uh, my friend Corey wants to know uh, how and when you started singing in public, and then how did you, at a very young age, make the leap into the studio scene in Muscle Shoals? Well, the studio scene came about the same time. Uh, you know, as far as I was concerned at my age, you know, that's kind of what there was at that time. Uh, was the studio scene that just, just erupted like pretty much in my backyard. And so naturally, as wanting to sing more than anything in the world, I gravitated to all of these studios in Muscle Shoals. And, uh, and it really became and still is really one of the recording capitals of the world in in my little hometown like how did that happen you know it's like or how did you get in the grateful dead or how you know this you know some of my friends are calling me the forest gump of rock and roll <laughs> <laughs> because i was there when this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened right. and things that don't normally happen i was there it's yeah, not weird. not a lot of people. No, no other human has on their resume on their resume Percy Sledge's "When a Man Loves a Woman," Elvis Presley's "Suspicious Mind in the Ghetto," and many versions of "Dark Star." <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's a pretty broad uh, pretty broad net you've cast. I so, don't know how anything happened. Yeah, well, it it did. <laughs> except that it did. And We're glad I, it did. Very little to do with it. But I was, at, and I still say this, I was at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Like in Muscle Shoals, when all of this started happening, uh, I was here, you know, and I had a very lucrative career, you know, doing background vocals. And then I just thought, I don't want to go to California so bad. You know, I just, I just wanted to break out to something. I knew that there was something that I wasn't getting and I wanted it so bad. And I had to tell, I had to personally tell Jerry Wexler why I was leaving the voice group. I mean, it was that wow. tight. Wow. The situation that we had around here. Yeah. And, uh, and then I went out to California and boom, I saw the Grateful Dead, and I thought we are we're all very fortunate you did. That was uh, for all of us. We thank you for that decision. And I'll t <laughs> I'll tell you, it could only happen to someone as wonderful as you because it's so oh. well deserved. Oh, you know, oh! You know, we we love you so much, DJ. And believe it or not, we have burned through this half hour already. I and know we, it. And we we've got to go to the movie. In a moment, you, you're going to go down to the bottom of the screen, folks out there, and click on the link. It's, it's on a separate screen. You'll click on the link for the movie. 
Uh, we got to do this again, DJ. We'll find another another show, maybe another show that you yeah. that you were involved in that we can show because we got to have you back. This we got one in mind. So, uh, we'll have you back if you if you if you join us again. We'd love to have you. Yeah. All right, my darlings. Okay, folks, keep donating all through the showing of the closing of Winterland. Yes. Uh, Dave, David, you want to tell them what we have in store next week? Yes, uh, next week's show, uh, next Friday, same time, 5 p.m. West Coast, 8 p.m. East Coast. Uh, it's an unreleased Grateful Dead concert from Foxborough, Massachusetts, July 2nd, 1989. A uh, wonderful show opens with playing in the band. It's got to lay me down. It's second set opens Friend of the Devil, on and on. And Gary, I think we have a special guest next week. Yeah, viewers, if you will indulge us, we're trying to give a break to a young man who's trying to make a name for himself in the entertainment industry. Uh, if I'm pronouncing his name right, it's Robert Weir. Is that right, Weir? I think yeah. you're right. Okay, Robert, Robert Weir. So give him a break. Be patient with him. He's going to be with us next week. Wow, Bobby, Donna, we've got an all-star team going here. We love you so much, Donna Jean. We love you, you out there in, in Shakedown Stream land. Enjoy the closing of Winterland. Uh, we'll see you on the streets of San Francisco at about 7 in the morning, okay? This was fun. Thank you, Donna. Bye. <laughs>